So good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining. My name is Nehal Patel, and today I'm going to talk about Amazon Athena. Amazon is a popular cloud service provider similar to Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Computing. Athena is cloud service from Amazon. Why Amazon Athena? It's all about big data analytics. When there is a need to analyze large amount of data, data which is in the size of terabytes, petabytes, these tools can be used. Tools like Hadoop Data Warehouse can even handle larger volume. The challenge with this tool is there is a need to provision resources, configure them, manage them, fine tune them, and data needs to be loaded before it can be analyzed. Yeah. Of course, the managed version of this tool can address many of these challenges. Still, there is a need to allocate resources and paid for, and data needs to be loaded before it can be analyzed. Yeah. Relational database, it's misconception that relational database can't handle large volume. Depending upon actual data, relational database can be used. But still, resource needs to be either managed or paid for, and data needs to be loaded before it can be analyzed. The NoSQL database can store very large volume, but it is designed for specific use case. When the key is known, it can retrieve the data in terms of milliseconds. In order to analyze the data, scan operation needs to be used. And depending upon cloud service provider, it could be very costly or there could be terms of restriction. Now, if you go for non-managed version of NoSQL, then like same challenges like infrastructure needs to be managed, configure it, fine tune it. Apart from this, there are other tools also available that can be used, but they will have similar challenges. The point here is when there is a need to analyze large amount of data uh, on an ad hoc basis and without a long-term commitment for the resources, without complex or time-consuming configuration or setup, without loading the data, Amazon Athena can help. So let's explore more about Amazon Athena. Amazon Athena is an interactive query service that makes it very easy to analyze the data using standard SQL. That means there is no learning curve. SQL query can be used to analyze the data. It's serverless, so there is no need to manage infrastructure. Data can be analyzed immediately. There is no need to load data into Amazon Athena. Just define the table schema and start using it. In case of Amazon, Amazon S3 is the most common place where data is stored. Apart from Amazon S3, data can be inside relational database, data warehouse, NoSQL, and there are many other tools that Amazon Athena can work with. One thing I would like to clarify is Amazon Athena is not a database. It's a distributed SQL query engine that lets you analyze the data where it is stored. Uh, anyone has any questions, comments so far, like the people on the online? So just, just so I understand, you can have your data in say anywhere in AWS and you hook a thing into it to query that data. So you can have all your data in S3 buckets and hook a thing in, tell it the schema, and then you query that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So Jeff is mentioning like, you know, the use case where like data can be anywhere. Yes. And we can point Amazon Athena to the data source and Athena can go there and start analyzing the data where it is stored. Yeah. Ed, you have a question? Uh, how is it billed? Is it per gigabyte scanned or something like that? Or So you are talking about how Amazon Athena can analyze the data? No, how, how do you, how do they charge you for it? Is it per so gigabyte like, scan? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll talk more about it, but yes, like, you know, uh, the one factor that depends on is the amount of data that needs to be scanned for a given query, but there is no upfront cost no commitment on resources or no minimum charges. All right, so let's take a look at quick demo.
So in the demo, I'm using two lists here. The one is the product list where the software details are maintained in a CSV file. And the second one is the user product mapping. The scenario is like user is using different software product for a company. And for the purpose of the demo, I already uploaded them to the Amazon S3. So this is our first list where two csv files are uploaded the structure of the file is same but this could be a scenario where data is exported on a regular basis like could be weekly or monthly cadence but the data is like ever growing so those those two they represent partition partitions exactly. it partitions can be used but as of now for the purpose of demo uh, partition is not used yeah and for the second list, there is only one file. So data is already uploaded. The next thing that is needed is we need to tell Amazon Athena uh, how to read that file. So AWS Glue is a service that maintains metadata about how to go to a file and how to read from the file. So let's create a table schema. And again, for the purpose of the demo, I already executed this. So this is a SQL statement using which database can be created. And on the left side, you can see it like it's already part of the list here. And this is the syntax for defining the table schema and you can see here that here they are pointing to our first list which is a product list and it's pointing to a directory that means all the file underneath are automatically accounted for when we query the data syntax is similar to a sql where columns are defined using the data type we'll talk so talkly about like uh, what this syntax is for, but here we are telling that this is a CSV file, it's comma delimited, and this is one of the built-in serializer, deserializer from Amazon Athena. We'll, we'll talk more about serializer, deserializer in next slide. So this is how metadata is defined. And even though another service is involved here, all this metadata will be in AWS Glue catalog. But Amazon Athena makes it transparent just by running SQL query. We can create those metadata. On the left hand side, if you can see here, the tables are already created using column and data type. One thing about this table schema is schema on read. So when we created this table structure, nothing gets validated. You can point to an empty directory. You can point to any other file, which is not CSV and Amazon is not going to complain until you start running your query. So now let's run this query. At this point, like even though the data is in CSV file, it is as good as like any relational database table. So there is a run button. And you can see all five rows are listed here. Uh, in the first CSV file, there are three rows and second CSV, there are two rows. But when we query against the table to retrieve all the data, Amazon Athena is able to uh, take care of all the CSV files that were present in that directory. This is our second list. Uh, this is just a user product mapping where like, okay, this user has this many product and like which license key is used by that particular user. We can write complex SQL. So Amazon, Amazon Athena has a full support for NC SQL standard. That means it can be as complex as like you can join multiple tables, you can apply group by, and any complex SQL syntax that is supported by 
and C SQL standard will be supported by Amazon Athena. This all details are coming from the CSV file that was uploaded to Amazon S3. Anyone has any questions on the demo? Yeah. Is so some of that defines a schema, right? There's metadata up top. Um, is that would that be in the glue table or is that specific for this session of, of Okay, so for, so for the online user, David is asking a question when this table schema is created, whether it is specific for the use by Amazon Athena, or this is a like a general metadata that is maintained in AWS Glue catalog. This is this becomes general metadata in AWS Glue catalog at this point, and uh, it can be used for any other purpose. As of now, like you know. Uh, this is one way to create this metadata. The other way is like we can directly go to AWS Glue Catalog and use those APIs to create this uh, table structure. But SQL query is like just making all those things transparent. Yeah. So how, how is the relationship between the product ID and the user product table and the product ID and the product table? How are they related? Like how are you defining that relationship? It seems like you are somehow. So the product list is like that ID is the product primary key for the product list. Yep. And this is just an association table. There is no user table. I haven't uh, created right. user table. This is just association table where user ID and product IDs are mapped. So the database doesn't know that that product ID is the ID of the other thing. No. Using SQL query, we are saying that, okay, like, you know, use these two column to join them. So in this, in yeah. this, in this join, like, you know, it's a left join. So basically like, you know, there could be a possibility of software product, which is not assigned to any user, but here we are telling how to join those two data. And unlike uh, relational database, like we don't need to worry about primary key or foreign key here. We just need to tell how to, Combine those data. Gotcha. So it's all in the query. Yeah. And so performance really stinks the first time you do it, and then it just caches it and gets better. Or... Oh no, it's stateless basically, like you know. So it stinks all the time. <laughs> okay. So yeah. before I Joel question was like you know whether any sort of primary key, foreign key concept available in Amazon Athena. No, it is not. We just need to tell how to combine data from different files and Amazon Athena will take care of combining them. The next point was like, is any of those details cached? By default, no, it's a serverless, no state is maintained. There is an option where you could reuse the result of previous query, but like you need to use special syntax where like store the result in a session and like you need to use the ID to be used by another query, but that is not the default. Like you need to make it work that way. Okay, Jeff has a question. So um, first one is, I think you mentioned, I just wanna confirm my own thought was that essentially when you're using S3 or CSVs and maybe other file types, you have to define a directory to represent the key. Could you go down one level deeper and have your different tables represented by different CSV files, or must you have a separate directory for every table? So Jeff's question is like, do we always have to specify directory in order to define the table schema, or can we point to an individual CSV file? Yes, we can directly point to individual CSV file. In that case, data will come only from that individual CSV. Second question. Um, I noticed you have something here like skip header, line count. So it sort of st starts to imply that you could have a header line in your CSV that represented the columns. Is there a way to use, I don't know if it's Amazon Blue or whatever, to have it introspect the CSV files to automatically learn the table schema? So you don't have to supply the table schema. You can have a CSV with a header row that defines the table. So Jeff question here is uh, in this particular definition for creating table schema, 
the syntax says keep the header line, but is there a way where we could tell AWS Glue that like just create a table schema using the header which is present in the file? Yes and no. Uh, there is a AWS Glue crawler. If you point that Glue crawler to a S3 bucket, it can automatically understand the schema, but it 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 will not use the name used as a header because there is a restriction on what can be like, uh, what characters can be part of the column name. So there is a glue crawler, like you can, you can make it work, like you don't have to go and define all of them. For most part, it can automatically detect how many columns are there, which data type it could be, but not necessary. It will use the actual header name as the column name because of the syntax issue, like. Yeah. Oh, no. uh, so Joel is getting it like referential integrity. Can you can you define indexes to make things faster? Anything like that? I need to double check, but I think yes, there are file format like binary file formats where on that file format you can create indexes. Not necessary Amazon Athena concept, but the file format specific uh, indexes like right. there are ORC files, Parquet files where you can improve your performance by creating indexes, by creating partitions. Is it all read only? Should I do, should I update something in the CSV rinser? It's coming. I was surprised that uh, Amazon Athena could be uh, uh, supporting insert, update, delete as well. Not only that, table level asset properties are also cool. supported. Okay, I think okay. someone has from the online had a question. Sorry, I ignored for long. Uh, can someone please ask the question? I think somebody raised the hand. I had my hand raised, but I was gonna, I think you answered the question. I was gonna ask about blue crawlers if they auto detect uh, schemas and it sounds like they do. I guess my other question is, is do glue crawlers auto detect partitions? Uh, at present, I'm not sure. Till like a uh, table schema, I'm aware that it can detect a uh, column and its corresponding data type. Uh, I'm not sure at present, like, you know, I, I will check and get back to you. All right, so. Okay, does anyone has any additional questions? Is everyone okay? Let's move on to the next one. So the use case basically, oops, sorry about that. Okay. So what are the typical use case for Amazon Athena? As you can see how quickly and easily we can start analyzing data using Amazon Athena. So it makes perfect case for ad hoc data analysis. You can just point uh, Amazon Athena to the data where it is stored. Amazon S3 is the most common use case where data is stored in Amazon ecosystem. And that's why Amazon Athena has a native support for Amazon S3. It is way easier and faster to analyze data if it is stored in Amazon S3 compared to other data sources. But of course, like other data source can still be used, but Amazon Athena makes it very easy to analyze data and quickly. For, this is perfect use case for ad hoc analysis. The second one is cost-effective data exploration. As we were discussing, like, you know, it's serverless. There is no, no commitment required. There is no upfront cost. There is no minimum charges here you pay for the data that is scanned by Amazon Athena. So that makes it perfect case for cost-effective data exploration and ETL and data transformation. So it's, as in the demo, you can quickly see that once the data is in Amazon S3, how easy, easy it is to analyze the data, which is make it perfect case for filtering those data, applying transformation and then set up an ETL job. This, uh, there are other cases like log and event analysis, data lake analytics. Data lake is a concept uh, or a term which is specific to Amazon where like 
data from the different system are maintained in Amazon S3, and that's kind of a, like similar to the data warehouse, but I like, you know, smaller, smaller scale where like it's referred as data lake, where those data can be analyzed as if like a uh, data warehouse. This is Amazon ecosystem. And as you can see, Amazon S3 is the most basic use case, like, you know, most frequently used data storage in Amazon ecosystem. Apart from that, like data could be in data warehouse, relational database, machine learning tools, and Amazon Athena can be integrated with BI tools for reportings, for visualization. Now, how Amazon Athena works how it makes it possible to analyze such a large volume of data. So Amazon Athena is a wrapper around a tool called Trino. Trino is a distributed query engine that lets you analyze data where the data is stored. So all these things came from Trino. Again, Trino itself has a history because it's a spin-off from the Presto. Presto was originally developed at Facebook. At Facebook, when they needed to analyze petabyte, petabytes of data, initially they were using Apache Hive, like Hadoop and ecosystem. They find it very slow and inefficient. So they came up with this new tool called Presto to speed up the analysis of the data. That's where it originated. Then after some time, the original developer who, who was behind creating this Presto, uh, the in conflict of interest arise between management and those developers. So their developer left Facebook and they spin off Trino out of Presto. So now like both are managed independently, but underlying mechanism is same for both of them. If we look at uh, Amazon Athena online documentation, the only thing that Amazon mentioned is it is using Presto and Trino. There is not much details available. So these details, uh, I found it from the third party. Please take it from a grain of salt. But basically, like I, I think like, you know, I should include this one. That way we know like how Amazon Athena can work with such a large volume. So let's take a look at pros and cons of using Trino. So we are talking about Trino, not the cloud uh, version of that, like which we, uh, which we are looking at Amazon Athena. In, on its own, Trino was SQL compliant query engine. So from beginning, like, you know, the vision was like, let's use SQL query to analyze the data. So you can use existing knowledge. There is no learning curve to analyze the data. It's cloud focused. Depending upon workload, new resources can be easily added and it can be scaled. It's agnostic data source connector, which makes it possible to analyze the data where it is stored. Now, the disadvantage of Trino on its own, basically lack of enterprise feature, like limited security. That means like there was no built-in support for encryption access control, like there was no role defined that way you can control like who can access what. Data source connectivity. So popular data source was supported, but the list was itself was not that huge. If we need to analyze Trino, Trino on our own, basically we are looking at configuration and setup, which could be like time consuming and complex. It's optimized for read-only access. So by default, it is tuned in a way to perform the analysis. If you want to do read-write, we are looking at uh, additional configuration. This is how the internal mechanism of Trino, there are coordinators, workers, and as you can see, like, you know, we can easily add new workers to take care of increasing workload. Fortunately, we don't have to do any of that one because Amazon Athena makes it transparent. Like if you look at the online documentation, none of this detail exists. Like, you know, this is Trino specific architecture. So like if Amazon is doing something different, like it's hard to tell. So again, like take it with grain, grain of salt, but like 
most likely this is how the internal mechanism of how Amazon Athena might be working. And it's transparent to us because Amazon is maintaining for us. Now, like in the documentation, Amazon mentioned that it is using Trino and Presto both. So what I, I figure out is the old version of Amazon Athena query engine was using Presto and like the uh, Amazon Athena engine version three is used, started using Trino. And that's where like, you know, it's saying, okay, like it's using Trino and Presto in the documentation. Uh, anyone has any questions? Yeah. So I guess for, you can configure like how many, you know, as figures you want. In Amazon, I'm getting, you don't, you have no configuration of that? No configuration at all. In fact, you don't have any control. And if I extend that one, uh, the, the question was like, you know, that in Spark, like, you know, there are some control where like how many nodes you want or you want to add, add extra. Can we do something about Amazon Athena? And the answer is no. In fact, Amazon Athena is a global service. Uh, like sometimes back, uh, there was a DNS issue at SAP and it bring, brings down all of the SAP across the globe, right? Think about like, you know, Amazon Athena at that level. There is no account specific or client specific infrastructure for Amazon Athena. It's a global service. All right, any other question? Okay, add his question. Yeah, in fact, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, Amazon doesn't publish SLOs for Athena, right? Or if they do, they're very relaxed. Like they don't offer uh, latency guarantees for how long your query will take because it is a global service. In fact, it's a reverse. They ask us to put a built-in, uh, sorry, they asked us to put a retry mechanism for Athena query execution uh, in the documentation itself because it's quite possible that you run the query and it failed first time and next time it is super fast and give you, gives you the result. Uh, that's that's one of the reasons, but, but you are right on that note. All right, so let me move on to like, what kind of data Amazon Athena can work with. In the demo, I have used CSV file, but maybe like, you know, when you are looking at data, which is very large, I think you should look at these binary formats like ORC and Parquet are column-based file format in a way that data is organized per column, which looks odd, but like it gives an advantage where like say out of 10 or 15 columns, you just need three or four columns. That makes it uh, optimization for Amazon Athena where it need not to touch rest of the column. Uh, Avro is also a binary format, but it's a row based. And how Amazon Athena knows how to read from these files or how to work with these files, how the data is structured. So that's where the serialization, deserialization comes into picture. During the demo, uh, I showed you a table schema where, let me actually go there. We specified survey. So this is serializer, deserializer, and this is the built-in serializer, deserializer from Amazon. Here I'm saying I'm using open CSV serializer, deserializer. So deserializer uh, is needed when data needs to be read from the storage and we need to serialize the data when the result is uh, stored back to S3. And that's how uh, Amazon Athena knows how to read from the data or you are reading from CSV, but you could write to a binary file format like ORC or Parquet. In that case, like Amazon knows that uh, there are additional syntax we need to specify uh, while executing the query. So this is just a table schema, but in here, the result of this query can be stored in different format by just using another syntax, which is like create table as select star from like many of you might have used. And in that we can specify how exactly we want our result to be stored. And that's where the serializer, deserializer comes into picture that helps Amazon Athena to understand about your file structure. 
in case of binary format, the data could be compressed as well. And that's where like, you know, this serializer, deserializer property makes it Amazon Athena to work with your files. So Amazon Athena has uh, the survey library supports, like, you know, it will make, you, uh, make it easy to work with popular file format, like CSV, JSON, Parquet, Org, Euro. There are, there are few more, it's available in uh, documentation. Unfortunately, Athena doesn't support custom survey. We can't support, uh, supply our own. We have to work with what Amazon supplies. Uh, anyone has any questions? All right. So the next is the schema update. One example I was showing is I had two CSV. That's the use case when the data is continuously exported on a regular basis. What if there is a schema change? Like if we want to add new column, we want to rename existing column. And that's where we need to be careful by choosing like which file format we want to support. And Apache Euro is the most flexible of all. So if you anticipate there could be lots of schema changes and you don't want to change your historical data, you, you still continue to analyze those historical data, then like Apache Euro could be a choice. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, ORC and Parquet is also flexible, but it has limited flexibility and like you need to choose your file format carefully. Of course, this is applicable only if you are looking at analyzing historical data and the data that is after the schema is chained. If you want to start from scratch or every time like you are starting from scratch, basically you don't need to worry about schema evolution and you can work with any of this file format. Next, let's look at the use case in the past, how I have used Amazon Athena. There were three different systems that has large amount of data in relational database. And there was a consumer application that needs to analyze those data and generate reports. We'll talk about like, you know, RDS snapshot and S3 in a bit, but basically like, why we didn't use say data warehouse because those report needs to be generated say 100 times per year. And basically like a data warehouse would be an overkill. If there would have been existing database, a data warehouse, that could have been perfect use case of like just using existing infrastructure and start generating report from data warehouse, but there were none. The second thing is, all those three systems has their daily snapshot taken. It's a daily backup that was already configured in a production system. And from Amazon, there is another service called export to S3. This is the service that allows to read the data from the backup and load those, load those data into a S3. And that's the reason that the snapshot and S3 is mentioned here because the snapshot were already there and all we need to use is uh, export to S3 service, just configure it, it points to the RDS snapshot and data is loaded into S3. Once the data is already in S3, basically it is very easy to analyze using Amazon Athena. The consumer application has a need to combine the data from all these three subsystems and apply complex business logic, transform it, and then generate different reports for various use cases. Of course, on an infrequent basis. Yeah. The, the export S3, is that the entire database schema or are there specific tables? Uh... It has support for both. If you, so uh, Greg is asking like, you know, export to S3, like do we need to export our entire database or can we export specific database table? Yes, it can, ex Amazon uh, export to S3 service has this capability where you can export entire database or you can just export uh, the list of the tables that we want in S3. And is that available for all RDS snapshot types? So like SQL Server, Postgres, 
yes for for most of the popular relational database it is available yeah. i have a couple questions so Earlier, you said that Athena can actually read the different types of sources. So Athena could, you could read from a Amazon or the RDS or the database, come a CSV that's sitting in S3, JSON sitting in S3. Can you combine your queries? So can you load up the schema from one source, like an RDS or a relational database, add another source that's from a CSV, and then write queries that combines that data? Yeah, Jeff is asking like, you know, if we have our data in relational database and our data in Amazon S3, can we combine them? Yes, we can definitely combine them. So if that's the case, why did you have to export to S3 if we're using Athena on that previous step? And why did you want to? Yeah, so all those are live system. And since we need to write our complex uh, SQL query that needs to touch large volume of the data. We don't want to overload those live systems. Yeah. And apart from that, none of those system had any read replica configured. We could have used read replica if it were there, but it was not there and adding one would add additional cost. And it's not worth it when like, you know, you are just looking at generating three, five reports per month. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. And just extending to Jeff's question, in fact, like one of our data was in Elasticsearch and we couldn't make it work. We didn't have sufficient time and we thought it's not worth it because those data we were able to find in another subsystem. So instead of exploring and making the Elasticsearch work, it was very easy just to use data from other system. But of course, yeah, Data from different uh, data sources can be combined and analyzed. That's what Amazon Athena is for. Once the table schema is defined, it really doesn't matter what is the underlying data source. Anyone has any questions so far about the use case that I used in the past? Okay. So these are the limitations that I encountered while working with Amazon Athena. These are the limitation which are either hard to find in a documentation or it does not exist. So Postgres supports a big data type and it wasn't supported by Amazon Athena. Of course, it says that like, you know, it's a standard SQL compliant and big data type is not. But just, just think like uh, very proprietary to relational database might not work in Amazon Athena. Of course, the it didn't fail. Data was there. We just need to treat that data as a string and find a workaround to work with that data. As I mentioned, we couldn't make Elasticsearch connector work for the use case. And we didn't explore much uh, either because we found those data in other system and we started using it. So when we were doing an uh, experiment with Amazon Athena, the query got timed out after 30 minutes. So that's when I learned that at account level, the default timeout limit is 30 minutes, it can be increased. And it's interesting because after six months or seven months, like for other purpose, similar query needs to be executed and the query, query finished in five, 10 minutes. The only scenario I think like, you know, that made it possible could be like, you know, internal optimization from as Amazon Athena itself, where like they might have optimized something. But it's quite possible that like, you know, if data needs to be analyzed, it's very large and like it, it could time out basically. The next one is the query execution is asynchronous. Unlike our relational database, we execute the query and get the result back. This is asynchronous. That means once the query is submitted, a uh, ID is given. So you need to make sure that query is submitted correctly. That itself is a uh, adding a complexity where like you need to add a retry, like whether uh, there was issue in submitting the query. Once the ID is there, then Amazon itself uh, recommend that planning a retry around the query. As we were discussing, Amazon Athena is a global resource and that's why like, uh, they suggest doing the retry. So once the ID is there, we need to continuously check what happened to the query. Did it succeed? Did it fail? And the next one is 
glue tables can repoint to newly exported data. In our case, we were exporting all the data every time. There was no data, like we were not exporting data. It's not an incremental export. So what we were hoping for was, okay, like we have now latest export, let's repoint glue table to the newly exported data. And it didn't work basically, like we need to recreate that table schema. We, we, we never needed one. Okay. And yeah, but definitely like you can go ahead and create partitions. For partitions also, there is a limited support. For example, like uh, there is a command that, ne that needs to be executed like uh, for new data, but then like uh, this table schema is very light with metadata. It's very easy to just like, you know, just go ahead and create a new one. As I mentioned, like, you know, it, it's it's very light, lightweight metadata. It's it's not doing anything more than just maintaining the metadata. Okay. So here, uh, like, you know, I was also surprised that Amazon Athena supports read, write. Not only that, at table level, it supports SE properties. So, uh, yeah, of course, but like, you know, you need to use specific type of table. There are like, you know, specific requirement in order to make this work. But yeah, of course, it can be done. That's the whole point here. Uh, anyone has any questions so far? Why would it be a good example? Why you would do this? Because that's not really the right use. It doesn't feel like the right use for this type of Okay, the one that I came across was the compliance. For example, you find some sensitive data and like you don't want that data to be analyzed. Now, like the only way you can make it work is okay, like, you know, just delete it. So like, it's not going to delete from the storage, but it will maintain that detail in a way that like, when you analyze that data, it will not appear. That could be one use case. So it doesn't actually delete, it doesn't modify the storage somewhere. I don't think so. I can't. I can't tell hundred percent. I haven't explored much, but I believe so. It says time series, and that's where I am making an assumption here that it knows which data is deleted. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. So cost wise, there is no up uh, upfront cost. There is no long term commitment in using Amazon Athena. That makes it perfect use case for ad hoc analysis. It makes it so easy, like you know, whether the data is in terabytes, petabytes, it can be quickly analyzed. Amazon charges five dollar per terabyte of data scanned. So you can imagine how cost effective that solution is, and specifically if you need to perform ad hoc analysis. And that cost itself can be brought down further by improving our query. As we were discussing, like, you know, we can create uh, partitions, like, you know, we can rewrite query and whatnot. The second thing is, as we were discussing, Amazon Athena is a global service, but it also support provision capacity. What does it mean? It means that you need to press, pay some, uh, cost for reserving the capacity. But for that, what Amazon Athena does is for the query, uh, it will prioritize your query. It will prioritize allocating resource to the query when the capacity is reserved. So if it is very important for use case, like, you know, to constantly perform or consistently perform, basically like, you know, we can use provision capacity. Yes, Joel has a question. So a lot of our customers want to know what something is going to cost up front. They want to predict for their costs, which I think if you were using batch jobs at this every month, you would, you would start to see some predictability. But if you throw like a BI tool in front of it and let somebody add it, could it generate like a huge bill and make the customer very angry? So what can be done to predict, uh, basically like we can look at the data size, like, you know, the worst case scenario is like, it needs to scan all of your data. So like, if you know our data size, say it is a couple of hundred terabytes, at least we can ballpark, like, you know, for each execution that maximum, it's gonna charge us like something like that. So it, it, once it's scanned it once, it won't charge you again. So if you say the same query tomorrow, will it charge you again? 
each query is independent it's stateless it okay. doesn't know anything okay. about yeah. yeah could you put guardrails on the code don't exceed a certain number of rows or Data. Don't exceed 10 gigabytes of data storage. No. So I could see that somebody messing up a query and then all of a sudden it's turning yeah, 8 billion, billion records yeah. or something. Uh, or okay. I guess yeah. the 30 minute timeout is your ultimate fail safe, but uh, yeah. yeah. Greg, Greg is asking, like, you know, is there any way where if, if you want to be very uh, budget conscious, like, you know, is there any way we can restrict the amount of data that can be scanned? And like it should just fail if like more than uh, that amount of data is scanned. As of now, like I don't know. Like I need to check like if it can be done. I think uh, I haven't explored much on provision capacity. I think in those scenarios it might help, where like it might be charged differently. But I need to explore. The next is the performance improvement. Of course, like, you know, in order to bring down the cost, we can uh, start using of efficient file format, like, you know, the binary file format, like ORC, Parquet, where the data is compressed and it's column-based file format, where like if only few out of like uh, many columns needs to be used for analysis, it can reduce the cost. AWS console also offer a way to look at the execution plan. So you can look at like, you know, uh, where the bottleneck could be or where like, you know, uh, it's not working efficiently. Uh, as I mentioned, like it could only require columns. So instead, instead of asking all the data, just ask for the data that is needed for the analysis. There is also a capability where query result can be reused. And of course we can always rewrite a better query like you know durability availability so this is the uh, point when like the result set when the query is executed the result is stored in amazon s3 like in here in the demo i haven't showed you here but like this query execution i need to configure here in the setting where my result is gonna stored Similarly, for each query, the result needs to be stored. Either it's temporary or the final result. And that's where this durability matters. This comes from Amazon S3 itself. Amazon S3 is, is a highly durable and available system. So that guarantee comes from Amazon S3 itself. Scalability and elastic, elasticity. So, sorry. Scalability and elasticity. Amazon Athena is a serverless. It's transparent to us, but when we looked at Reno architecture, like basically more nodes can be added in order to take care of additional workload. And Reno itself was built from cloud in mind. So scalability is inherent. Security authorization encryption, basically like who has access to data? S3 has. If the data source is S3, specifically we are talking about the result, when the where the result is stored, we can restrict who can read those results, which role, which permission, like everything can be set up. We can encrypt our data, either encryption from Amazon can be used. If we want to use our own encryption, we can specify our own encryption key and Amazon will use that one. The next one is how we can use the Amazon Athena. In the demo, I showed you a UI, it's AWS console using which the data was analyzed. Apart from that, the command line tools is available itself from Amazon, uh, SDK for various languages, and there is a JDBC connectivity as well. It also integrates well with Amazon QuickSight for visualization, and Amazon S3 has a native support. And that's why we, we never needed to worry about like how that connectivity uh, look like. But if we need to connect other data source, that's where this Athena federated query, which leverages Lambda comes into a picture where the connectivity comes from another Amazon service, uh, which is executed in a Lambda. 
and these are different data source like you know amazon rds be it postgres mysql that can be connected uh, via amazon athena and apart from that if we need to write our custom connector like you know our proprietary system where amazon athena needs to be connected amazon uh, has a Athena query federation SDKs are available, which can be extended to make it work with proprietary system. Uh, I think that's all uh, questions. Yeah. Not a question, but one other real world example we use this on sub assist is the, the load balancer logs are written into S3 as access log files and you have to use it to then secure that. And that is partition data has to be and it's compressed too but we can go all the way back to the beginning of the app and, and go find specific ip addresses and things and so forth so or string well so they, they actually tell you it, yeah it's a common schema that amazon tells you about but you do the same exact thing you create the table so Greg is pointing out uh, Amazon specific tool or Amazon specific load balancer which generates the logs and that can be analyzed using Amazon Athena. It's interesting use case because by default, uh, the access log for load balancer are not available in CloudWatch logs. Right. Amazon Athena has a CloudWatch service for like, you know, uh, data uh, logs can be ingested into CloudWatch logs and CloudWatch logs has its whole uh, ecosystem where data can be analyzed. But by default, this access log doesn't go to the CloudWatch logs. And in the, absen in the absence of any tool to analyze like access log, uh, Amazon Athena became only like an you know, only option to easily analyze your access log basically. Uh, any other questions? Anyone on the online? All right, then thanks everyone. Uh, I have put some uh, reading material here. And as I mentioned, like, you know, all the syntaxes or, or the use cases uh, comes from the Amazon documentation. It's reliable. Some of the history that I mentioned came from the third party. Please take it with grain of salt. Like, you know, the internal working of Amazon Athena, like Amazon itself doesn't publish much. So it's it's a little, little bit of mystery over there, but like hopefully like it, it shouldn't be much uh, different from how Trino or Crestro works. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Snell. Thank you.